right, hey y'all. Dr. Ethel Young Skurlock, Associate Professor of English and African American Studies, Director of African American Studies, and Senior Fellow of Lucky Day Residential College, joined the faculty of the University of Mississippi in 1996. She is a native of Memphis and earned her BA in English from the University of Tennessee and MA and PhD from Bowling Green State University of Ohio. Dr. Skurlock has published numerous articles and reviews of African American literature and signal publications. Her excellence in teaching is notable, being named the College of Liberal Arts Teacher of the Year in 2003, UM Humanities Teacher of the Year, and the Elise M. Hood Outstanding Teacher Award in 2011. She was the first African American awarded with this prestigious commendation. A 2013-14 thir SEC Academic Leadership Development Program Fellow, Skurlock has also been recognized by the Mississippi House of Representatives honoring her work to promote diversity. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. What an awesome introduction. Great audience for today. I've been given a very, very large topic. I promise that I won't try to take a large amount of time. So my goal today, um, I have a presentation I'm going to walk through, kind of share how I see these issues of race, social justice, and spirituality intertwined, especially talking about spirituality and social justice. Um, talking about those pieces. How do I see those intertwined? How do I work them together in my personal and professional life? And then hopefully have a conversation uh, with you all about some of these issues. So Alexis, did you provide screen sharing? You did, okay. And I hate doing it this way because I can't see everybody's face. So I'm gonna get through this part um, as quickly or expeditiously as I can to make sure we have plenty of room to talk. Uh, slideshow, give me just a minute. Okay, I always feel like the butt of the joke, how they talk about old people trying to get the PowerPoint together on Zoom and share screen. Uh, so that's me, it takes me a moment, but, but we get it done. So I've titled my presentation today, Made the Work I've Done Speak for Me. And that's from an old hymn uh, that was published in 1977, as far as I can find out. But we grew up singing it when I was a child in church, when it says, when I've done the best I can and my friends don't understand, may the work I've done speak for me. And that is the kind of life I have really tried to live, where overall, it's not what I say, it's not about me having a social media presence or um, trying to present to the world a certain ideology. I just want the work to make a difference and for my work to maybe go into rooms that I will never be able to enter into. Here at the University of Mississippi, I serve as the Director of African American Studies. I'm an Associate Professor of English and African American Studies, and I'm also the Faculty in Residence or the Senior Faculty Fellow at the Lucky Day Residential College. I will also say that in addition to that work, I serve as the pastor of two small rural churches that I love to life. If you've ever had told me growing up in Memphis that I would love living in Mississippi, engaging in rural areas, like I would not have seen this in my future, but that work is so critical and so important. And I talk just a, in just a moment about maybe how I see that connected to this mission of uh, spirituality, race and social justice. So my objectives today, uh, to one, provide a general definition of social justice. Two, present personal spiritual, my, my personal uh, spiritual paradigm. Um, how do I line up social justice work with my Christian teaching? And then to talk about some practical ways that I try to live out social justice um, in my professional life. So what does social justice mean? In many cases, when we talk about social justice, people automatically conflate that with race. And it is advocating for people who are considered to be minority groups in institutions. But when I think about social justice, and when you look at the standard definitions, it's much larger than that. And I think we miss out on a lot when we think about it only in that term, or only in terms of race. So social ju justice is really a belief that everyone deserves equal economic, political, and social rights and opportunities. It's not saying that we all would make the same money or we all would make the same educational decisions, but it means that we have access. We have the opportunity to make those decisions. We have the opportunities to build up and to be supported and, and to be um, viable um, economically. Also actively working to open doors of access to everyone, 
especially those in the greatest need. And those in the greatest need may not always be people who we see, like for me, I do my work in African-American studies, but it's not always about being African-American. And I'll tell you about an engagement I recently had with one of our local business owners who I've used, um, and I won't say his name because I still love him very much. We've had some interesting conversations since this um, kind of this exchange took place. But it's a local business owner who I've used for almost every catering event that I have done of any scale and any size. Um, and we have a great relationship. I, and not only do I use him in my personal life, I use him for big events. I've had him used for big recruiting conferences. I mean, I was always advocating for him. So I would use him for big events. Well, with the pandemic hit, our local business has really hit in a major way. Now I cook some, but I'm not a grand cook. Like I wouldn't be on television or anything doing it. I do a little here, a little there. So I host uh, my family's Thanksgiving meal every year. And we have about 50 people that come in. And uh, one of the things I always do to make it easier for me, cause I like making the size. I buy this Cajun turkey from Honey Baked Ham. I buy two Cajun turkeys. Then I buy my Honey Baked Ham hams cause that makes it easier. I don't have to really deal with meats a whole lot. So I do those things. It's a staple. Everybody expects it. This year, I didn't do that. I'm, I'm getting somewhere with this. So this year, I didn't do that. I bought the um, turkeys and the hams from the local business person because I felt like honey bake, you know, they're going to be in business no matter what. Uh, and so let me use my local business person. Well, right after that, almost, this person posted this public statement because of something the university was doing with equity. And they said, um, they're just trying to teach uh, white students to hate their race uh, over there. And we don't need to know anything about equity. And I wrote him personally and I said, you know, that was so disappointing for me because equity is not about race and it's not about hating anybody. And I've never had you do my Thanksgiving meals. I have you do my huge events with 100 to 1,000 people. I've had you do those, but this year I left a the, what I normally do to support you as an act of equity but you see equity as hate. So he picked up the phone within 20 minutes of me sending it. We had great conversations around it. But I'm saying all that to say, we really have to expand and understand how um, equity, uh, social justice can impact and help all of us, regardless of our gender identity um, and regardless of class, really providing opportunities for everybody. Finally, social justice is organized around four principles. One is equity, which is what you've heard me say a lot. The second thing is access, which is what I feel like I try to provide in a lot of the work that I do. Participation, so that people don't just come and show up. I do a lot of work with African-American history and legacy at the University of Mississippi. We know we were integrated in 1962, but for many years you saw black people come and be here. They had access to the institution, but there were no routes for people to participate. So participation is a part of social justice and then rights, um, opportunities so that you feel protected in those spaces. My personal paradigm. So how do I line up social justice with Christian teaching? Because one of the things that I'm really surprised about is that everybody doesn't do that. And then there are churches that are now um, teaching this idea of social justice being anti-Christian and against the teachers of Jesus. And I really can't imagine how they do that. I'm not attacking anybody, but I can't imagine it because when I read the word of God for me, for me, it is such a liberatory text. And it's all about freeing voices and freeing people and providing access and equity and all of these things that we've talked about. So while Christianity does have a long history of oppression in its practices, when you read the teachings of Christ and the Old Testament teachers that precede uh, the teachings of Christ, to me, they are always aligned with issues of liberation, freedom, um, and equity. The readings of Old Testament and New Testament narratives open up spaces for women to speak Women, women to be led, to be healed, and to influence others in their society. I ran through a few examples, Esther, uh, who, who in her society didn't have a right to go see a king unless she was asked to come. And she decided finally after being coerced, I'm gonna go see the king and try to save my people. So giving voice to her, Rahab, who uh, was a woman of Ill, Ill repute, but she's used to gain access to the promised land for the children of God. I won't keep going. Uh, the Samaritan woman at the well, one of my favorite stories, this woman who has this one-on-one this -on -one meeting with Jesus. 
And when Jesus meets her, he's like, where's your husband? And we know that was like, you had to have a husband to be protected in society. She's like, I don't have a husband. He was like, I know, not only do you not have a husband, but the, um, the man you had five and the man that you're living with right now is not your husband. And so like this kind of confrontation with this woman who would have been castigated by her society um, and all of a sudden bringing her into the fold. And if you continue to read that story and the word says that after this happened, then she goes out and tells everybody, come see a man that told me all about myself. And from that, a whole town is changed and transformed. So this woman who is struggling to be seen and invisible in her society, not only becomes visible, but she becomes an agent of change in her society. So that's how I line these up with my Christian principles. To go deeper into the word of God, um, just a little bit, I want to share just a few scriptures that I think um, emphasize that. So Galatians 3.28, the word of God says, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. That's equity, that we're no longer dividing people based on these identities of race, nationality, uh, who's on top, that all of us come together as one body. I also see uh, sentiments of social justice in Psalms 82 and 3, where we are told, defend the poor and the fatherless, do justice to the afflicted and needy. So we don't look at people who are struggling and blame them for their struggle and, and cast it upon them, the burden to lift themselves up from their bootstraps, that we have a mandate that is telling us for those who are struggling economically, those who don't have family structures to help them, we don't put them on blast and talk negatively about them. Instead, we figure out how do we do justice? How do we intervene? How do we engage? Isaiah 1 and 17, I love this. It says, learn to do right. And that's why college is so important to me and the work we do at the University of Mississippi and everything that I do in terms of uh, pulpit, preaching and teaching, that rightness, you know, sometimes we think, oh, oh, I just do what's in my heart. And I just preached a sermon a few Sundays ago when I told my people, when you're stressed, the worst thing you can do is follow your heart because the word of God says the heart is deceitful above all things. And your heart will tell you, cuss them out walk away, you know, do this, do that, you know, so don't call it hard, learn to do right and seek justice. When it says seek justice, that lets me know that justice is not always easily identifiable. It's not always easy to see. When you're seeking something, that means sometimes you've got to move some stuff out of the way. You've got, you've got to um, work hard. You've got to clean up. You've got to seek it. So justice is something that we should be seeking as part of our spiritual journey. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless again and plead the case of the widow. And we know widows had no way of coming up with the economic way, um, economically defending themselves. And so to say the, those who cannot defend themselves, we have a mandate to defend them. Okay, let me keep going. So what does social justice look like for me in my professional life? One, I'm always somewhere talking about it as you see on their microphone and as we are doing here today. So I'm like, I always get mad at the university and I'm like, why is it that every picture they publish of me, my mouth is wide open, but probably because my mouth is always wide open. But so I just kind of use it for myself. So one, for me, it means when I'm making curriculum decisions, I'm always thinking about social justice and equity. So I've been teaching in the Honors College 101, 102 series for about 15 years now, um, off and on. So I did it about probably five to seven years. And then I pulled out when I first went to Lucky Day for a while. Then I came back because we didn't have really anybody of color. And when I first came back, we decided these common core texts every year. I'm like, y'all, what are we doing? Like, we have such a diverse student body. Why are we back to teaching? That year that I came back, they were teaching four texts by white men who were all German speaking uh, originally. And I'm like, what are we doing? Like we couldn't even have diverse white men. Like we, we gotta do something different. So those curriculum decisions to talk about the fact that we wanna add breadth and depth 
to all of our students that we want people to understand great ideas that are global in nature. How do we make that look? What, what does that look like in honors in the honors college? What does it look like in English? Um, years ago, I used to teach a course in women's literature. And when I taught this women in literature course, I made sure that diverse women were included. And it was funny because students, when they heard women in literature, many of my students assume white women. And so when they would come in and see that we were doing Native American women or black women and white women, like nobody was left out because I believe in equity. They were like, well, this should have been called multicultural lit. Why? Well, they're all women. They're all women. So like, why would you think that I don't have a right to put women of color in. So those things that expand our mindset. Oh, there's a book that I used to love by uh, all, called, all the all the blacks are men, all the women are white, but some of us are brave. So that work in terms of putting people in the curriculum. Opening doors for educational access to rural Mississippi. Somebody I think is walking across campus and not muted. Did everybody else hear that voice? Yep. Yeah, I tried to talk loud over it. Okay, okay. So, um, number two, open the doors for educational access to citizens in rural Mississippi. And that's a work I'm really passionate about. And it's not race-based at all that if any of y'all are from rural areas, we'll talk about that in just a minute. We know that counselors are doing the best they can, but sometimes they don't have access to information. They're not connecting students to scholarship information, application information, scholarship deadlines. And so I'm always out there doing that work on my own. It has nothing to do with my job. Really, my primary job is just teach two classes a semester and go home and sit down. But I pick up the other things administratively. And this is something that I do out of passion. I do it through the church community. I do it through conferences here on campus that I want students, if, and, and one of the things I've been ar not arguing for, uh, advocating for and talking to our chancellor about, and he's moving on this, is the fact that we've got to stop waiting on people from some rural areas to come to us. We have to go to them. Let's take the material to them. So let's not sit up and cry about who's not coming and who doesn't apply. Let's go show them what it looks like. Let's assist them. I've had students come to Lucky Day and we just put them on the computer, fill it out. I'm not telling you, you have to come here. It may not be your fit, but I want to open the door for access. I want you to know all the things. I don't know why my thing translated to all these number ones, but maybe because God is saying it's all number one. It's all critical and important. Advocating for the engagement of people who are in, um, and, and people, Black, Indigenous, people of color communities. So how do we better engage in all levels and areas of the work that we're doing? Really working in um, admissions um, and in conferences and on committees to make sure that we're admitting in a way that is just, and that we're looking at people beyond numbers. You all know very well, um, I, we know people who have 36s on ACTs, and yet they're not doing well in terms of GPAs, they don't have any kind of work ethic and they flop in their first semester of college. Then we know people who have 21s who come in uh, and they're shooting stars and, and they become maybe the president of ASB. So we try to make sure we're looking at people beyond these numbers. I've advocated for that. I'm on the Honors College admissions team, for example, and in our first level reviews now, we don't see ACT scores at all. And people are always shocked by that. We don't see the ACT scores. We grade people based on engagement, leadership, and your academic rec record, what classes you have taken and how you succeeded in those classes. And in the end, it hasn't made a big difference in what the average ACT score is. So before we looked at ACT score, the average ACT score rested around a 32. Not looking at it, it's still resting around a 32, but it's giving more students a chance who wouldn't have a chance if you were trying to judge them based only on that number. Uh, sitting on scholarship selection committees, which is a lot of work. Mary Sharp, I think, was on the line, and she can tell you it's a lot of reading, a lot of work, and just making sure, again, justice is everybody gets a fair shake and a fair look. It doesn't mean that those people will in the, in the end win the scholarship or have the opportunity by always making sure everybody has a fair look. And then using my voice to advocate for any resource that I think is necessary to help an underserved population. So that's what I do in my everyday work. This is work that I don't advertise or I don't talk about a lot, but it's just a part of what I do. 
And I hope that whatever your career is, you'll find those ways that you can do that. The last thing that I said is connect your students and local businesses with resources. Because I'm always all, all about our local businesses. Like we've got to lift them up. We've got to get over to Chicory Market and get up to the square, the square books. And, um, you know, I can't wear the clothes in the square, but I can wear some of the shoes and the jewelry. I just try to support our local businesses so that they can survive in this rough climate. I love this quote. I just wanted to share this before um, we conclude today. I have a couple of concluding slides. This is about Martin Luther King Jr. And this is just kind of a way that I think describes who I am and what I am. This is like always in the back of my head. He said, I have the audacity to believe that peoples everywhere can have three meals a day for their bodies, education and culture for their minds and dignity, equality and freedom for their spirits. And that's what social justice is to me. My personal life ethos and the way I try to carry out this work, I'm not a person that's gonna be at the front of a march. I'm not gonna be a person with a megaphone in my hand. I'm not gonna be the person that every time I have a problem with somebody, I'm putting it on social media and challenging people. That's not who I am. The work I do is behind closed doors. It is collegial. We may argue and have issues behind closed doors, but in the end, we're all on the same team. We all want, if I'm working in the church, we all want the church to thrive and grow. If I'm working with the Women's Council, in the end, we all want our students to have the best experience. So I'm just not gonna be somewhere. And I don't critique people who do, please don't hear that. That's not who I am. So your social justice doesn't have to be something that's lived out loud. So my life ethos is working towards social justice and spirituality is not just about what happens on the mountaintop. There is much work to be done in the valley. So if you're looking for me, I'll always be in that valley working hard, trying to find my way home. I just want to end by circling back to where I, where I started with the lyrics of that hymn. Um, the bridge to it says, the work that I've done, it seems so small. Sometimes it seems like I've done nothing at all. But when I stand before my God, I want to hear him say, well done. May the works that I've done speak for me. That's all I have to say. I am Ethel Skurlock and I have my email address if you wanna contact me and I'm gonna stop the share so I can see your lovely faces and engage. Thank you, Ethel. Does anyone have questions, comments? Who wants to be the first to go? Oh, I thank you, Ethel. You did a marvelous job of pulling together the whole equity aspect and faith and living it out. And uh, you, you did it in such a beautifully organized, concise way. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. I, I took some that. good notes. Thank you. Ethel, I love that. You, I think I'm more impressed with you every time I hear you speak. And I was you. wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about the work that you're doing with the chancellor. I'm so excited to hear that you're hopefully advising him and, and encouraging him to do this outreach and to, to get out into the communities. Can, can you tell us a little bit about what that work looks like on the ground level? Well, I, I, and I'm not going to say I'm advising, but now again, I'm the person <laughs> that picks up the phone and says, can I talk to you? Honey, I got some issues. And so, and that's what I do. And he answers and I'm so thankful. And, you know, I'm like, can I have me, you know, so we'll go over there and meet and talk about it. So he really um, asked me about some things. I told him what I thought was important. He actually took, I wrote a proposal that talked about um, the program originally was called UM Reach, like Rural Educational Access. Mm -hmm. um, and they changed the name. Um, U Reach was what I called it. No, M Reach. But they've changed the name some. It's been inserted in someone else's job description, which I'm really excited about. Um, and so it will come to fruition. This program that I've been dreaming about and talking about and arguing for for a long time, where they will actually go out to rural areas. But yeah, I just call up and say what I need. And I thought about using this example. You know, I was talking to somebody once and they were like, well, you're interested in stuff on the micro level, what happens big? And I'm like, well, if you don't do it on the micro level, nothing happens big. So here's a really micro example of the kind of work he's helped me with. I had a, a person from a rural community call me maybe three weeks ago now, three or four weeks ago. She had a job on the table from um, Methodist Hospital. She had graduated from a district 
uh, I don't even know how she got my name because I had nothing to do with it. She graduated from a small rural district. She didn't at first pass the test they have to take that goes along with that, but she took it that summer. And this happened like in 2005. So they sent her her diploma, but they never signed her transcript. She kept calling the school to say, I need a signed transcript. She had gone to get another certification and Methodist was going to take the job opportunity away from her because she couldn't have a signed high school transcript. They refused to talk to her and said, you know, it's nothing we can do. The superintendent at that time is dead and, you know, it's your loss. And I'm like, that's not equity. That's not justice. And, and they shut down. They stopped answering the phone. So she called me and I'm like, I don't work with high schools. I don't know what to do. Then I was like, well, Lynn Boys was over the whole IHL. So, so he can help me. So, so he probably thinks I'm crazy. I sent him a text and said, I need to talk to you. I need some help about who I can call. And I did. And he gave me the people to call. And um, she now has her transcript signed and she started her job uh, this week. So that little stuff to me, that's what equity is about, making those doors open and advocating for people who have lost the ability to advocate for themselves. So they wouldn't, they wouldn't answer for this little lady, but when Glenn and I got on the phone, started calling around, all of a sudden ask, phones were answered again. So I'm thankful for that. Dr. Scarlock, this is Candy Simmons. Um, excellent job. I really enjoyed um, listening to you and hearing what you have to have, what you've said. But I would like to hear a little bit more about um, conversations that you have either had to advise maybe students to have. Talking about social justice, equity, and race is not an easy topic. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sure there have been plenty of times where you've had, whether it be colleagues or even students, because I know that we're on here with a lot of students, can you give us an example of maybe a time when you had to advise a student on having a difficult conversation with someone who may not have looked like them or may not have been giving them a fair shake, but they needed to have the conversation in order to get something achieved? For example, just like you said, this lady called you because she couldn't get um, her tra assigned transcript. But, you know, there's times when people may offend us, but we feel like we need to speak up. So. Can you kind of tell us a, an, an example of something along those lines? Yes, um, it's hard without saying, so the first thing I think about is a student who was an orientation leader here, African-American female, uh, brilliant, absolutely brilliant, pre-med kid, full of energy though. Anytime you saw her and some, some of them can guess maybe who I'm talking about, but I'm not gonna say her name. Uh, but I mean, absolutely brilliant. She was always dancing and energetic and greeting everybody and in the middle of anything that was happening. Um, and about a year and a half, two years ago, she was in a chemistry class and she's an engager, like she's an engaged learner. And she has to have somewhere between a 3.8 and 4.0 in their pre-med curriculum. So um, she was in physics and um, she was engaging and the professor absolutely went off on her. I mean, just went off publicly, um, made all these negative statements about her and basically kind of like she didn't have a right to be there. And I'm like, okay, so how do we get around this? How do we advocate? How do we go back in a different way? And so she did have to go in and engage and talk and talk about her academic prowess, which is something that really, it shouldn't have been on her to have to do that. But in the end, she ended up earning an A in the course. But they thought because she was an engager, because she talked, and she's a jokester. I mean, you can be talking about anything. She'll find a way to make you laugh about it. They thought she wasn't taking her work seriously, but she just had a different cultural style of engagement. So I thought about that example for a student. Um, but I will say it is difficult for students to confront these issues early on. I see Ian Pig on the line and Ian was in my one-on-one -on -one and one-on-two courses. And I will have to say, I think sometimes when people walk in, it's like, oh my God, that's who I have for one-on-one, -on -one, like in one-on-two. Um, and then I think Ian, you know, some classes are all on board with that curriculum that I do and some are not. And I've had students tell me like, I'm tired of talking about race. And I, you know, I don't fight that. I just say, oh, I understand. I said, imagine how I feel. I've been doing it 50 years. So I'm sure you can make it through these 15 weeks. We'll, we'll just get through, you know, we will. So, um, I, you know, it is work. It is difficult. It is a struggle for them. But telling African-American students, you know, I always struggle 
we, we're going through this reunion right now with students who were involved in the 1970 protests. It's actually the last session that's happening right now. Uh, but we've had them here Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. We had a panel last night with students who had had protests. And they, some of those students talked about trauma from having to protest, trauma from having to advocate the whole time they were here. So I you know, don't know where I stand about where it comes to students having to advocate and then take trauma away from their body when they leave this institution. Uh, we shouldn't have students that leave this. This is a place that, where you should feel empowered and energized to do the work. You shouldn't leave feeling like there's something you carry with you that is a scar. And, and that makes me sad. So I can't think of other examples off the top of my head, Candy, but I'm gonna think of some more. Uh, so if I ever present this again, I'll bring them up. Thank you. No, that was good. Um, you know, I attended Ole Miss. I had an awesome experience and thank God I don't have that trauma, but I do know that there are students who have it. They don't come back to campus. Um, they don't have a connection with the school. So I was just interested in your feedback. So thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Dr. Scurlock, you brought up something pretty nice that um, you know, that I that came to my mind when you were talking about some of the things today. Um, born and raised here in Mississippi as an Asian minority student, you know, a lot of the times, one thing that I hear a lot from a lot of my friends that I like to educate them on is that they'll always say, You're so you're you're almost like a white student, you're so whitewashed. And you know, I'm not, you know, I don't feel offended by that when they tell me that, but instead I see it as an opportunity for me to educate them on that term. And a lot of the times, you know, we tend to put minority students that are educated as somehow as a hierarchy. And that kind of creates this problem. So, you know, a lot of the times when I was growing up, especially in high school, a lot of the kids will come up to me and say, oh, wow, your, your accent, the, the first thing they point out is your accent, the, the accent. They say, oh, you're from here? I'm like, yeah, I was born and raised here just like you, just like everyone else. And um, I think that's a, you know, it's a big conversation when, you know, some, when someone comes to you and uh, approaches you in a manner that puts you in a position like, oh, you know, they want to make you feel better about yourself. And, you know, they take away what your background is. And I think that's important that we educate ourselves on terms like that and moving forward because, you know, we are in 2021 now and the way we approach certain things is much different than it was years before. So um, that topic that you have brought up about that student, the pre-med student kind of brought that to my mind. I love everything that you said. And I think it's so important that we don't think about um, identity in these monolithic ways. My daughter deals with a lot of that. She's a, she'll be starting her freshman year at Ole Miss in the fall, but she's had peers at Oxford High tell her white peers, you know, I'm blacker than you. You know, like, what does that mean? Like, what, do you, what, what does that mean? What do you know about her? And all you really know about her is her presentation publicly and how she speaks. Um, and she's in this dual enrollment program at Northwest right now. And she was in class and we laughed about it, but you know, so it is funny, but it wasn't funny, but she was in class and the professor says to her, are you from Australia or South Africa? And she was like, what? <laughs> and they were like, your accent, are you from Australia or from uh, South Africa? You don't sound like you're from here at all. And she was like, mom, like, how many levels are wrong is that? Like I would leave Australia to come to the United States. I would land in Mississippi and then I would land in Northwest, but not just Northwest, but the branch campus. <laughs> Northwest, like this, that professor should have processed all of that before they even asked me that question. And the funny thing about it is that she does sound like she's from Mississippi. She has a Southern accent, but she doesn't have an accent that many people identify with black bodies um, when she speaks. So this idea of saying that's not black, it is black. It is just a different version of black than what we see projected in media. And the media, you know, I used to tell students years ago when I was really teaching pop culture stuff, like, stop thinking you know something black from watching videos, like, because you watch some videos, like, it's the same women. It's like 75 women in all the videos, period. And you're letting these 75 people judge, uh, help you judge or think you know anything about black identity and you don't. And all of it is filtered through a white lens by the time it comes to the community anyway. So no, you, we don't know people based on what we think we know. So thank you, Daniel. I think that's important. And that's an important conversation for us to have 
uh, that that's part of social justice, right? Saying um, we see people as individuals and not just in terms of identity. Hi, Dr. Skirlock. I have a question. Okay, uh, Alexis. So I was wondering, thank you so much for your presentation, by the way. Um, but I was wondering a lot of times when you bring up topics like these people kind of like to dismiss it as being too political or they just say oh you're too political like stop being so political um so I was just wondering if you had a response that you could bring up to say back to them and kind of like steer their conversation yeah and so I don't um I don't have a canned response I probably should have one um and I try not to speak about the, like for Today, I was asked to talk about this as a platform. I don't, in general, like I wouldn't go to dinner and have a conversation about social justice more than likely. Like I, that just wouldn't be my normal conversation, but I would be working towards social justice at dinner without talking about, what do you think about the march? What do you think about the people that crawled on the walls of the Capitol? Like I'm not, <laughs> not gonna talk about that, but I am working to make sure more people don't crawl on the walls of capital in the future. So I don't know if that makes sense what I'm saying. So I, in general terms, debating Black Lives Matter or debating this, I'm not going to do just that. But I want to do work that expands how people think so that you won't think about it in the same way. I taught a class last semester. It's really amazing. And it had um, about half of the class were donors to the university, which kind of was uncomfortable at first. One of them was the brother of one of our old Miss Women's Council members, which I didn't even know until we were almost finished with the class. Um, but he's a retired doctor in Alabama. I don't know if most of the Women's Council people know. Edward Wilson was in my class. Um, most people know who Edward Wilson is. So he was in my class. Bruce Ware was in the class. Um, a big donor from Texas, Texas Christian. All these people were in this class. And so we were talking about these issues and in the end, they were coming back, even though I wasn't always addressing those issues, they were like, you know, I was at church and somebody said something about Black Lives Matter. And I said, no, you can't think like that. You know, they addressed it in a different way, even though I wasn't advocating in that way, it opened their minds to think about issues in a different way. So don't carry that burden of feeling like you've got to carry this load and you've got to make people think in a certain way. and You've got to make them engage in certain ways. No, do your work and let the work speak for you and do that work wherever you are. If you're in public policy, if you're in the medical field, black people are dealing with racial disparities in healthcare. So you don't have to go and fight on the march for me, but I need you when I come in to take time and tell me what's wrong with my body. I don't need you to be dismissive and say, cause I'm black and fat and old, you don't want to treat me. I need you to treat me fairly. So am I making sense? So do the work. You don't have to talk about what you do, just do it and do it well and make real life changes as educators, as doctors, as attorneys, do this work. That's what we need. I'm tired of talking. I'm getting old, don't talk about it, be about it. Okay, I'll leave y'all alone. <laughs> Dr. Skurlock, I appreciate you for bringing um, this very important topic uh, to us. and. And as we think about the very important work centered around diversity, equity, and race, um, you know, Dr. Beverly Tatum talks about this smog of racism that surrounds us all. Um, and when we consider unconscious bias and how that shows up within us, you know, there's lots of learning and unlearning to do. And so I'm currently reading Unconscious Bias in Schools. Multiplication is for white people. I am in um, the education field. And so these are continuing to support me on my journey. And I was wondering, are there any books or texts that you would recommend um, as others continue their journey in becoming anti-racist? Well, one I used for the first time, and I actually used the videos um, this semester. I tell you two things that are not, so I read, first of all, I primarily read fiction. Um, and I teach fiction. So that's what I'm most up to date on. But the books that I'm gonna recommend are not written by African-Americans, but I think they're helpful for doing what Golda said. And I've used one of them for the first time last year, one for the first time this year. The first one is Outliers by um, Malcolm Gladwell. I see some people nodding their heads. I, I just love that because it makes us look at 
our errors, the things that we're doing wrong in society, how we're holding people back on every level, not just people based on race, color, gender, everybody, like we are living underneath our potential. So outliers, I think is really good in terms of stretching our imagination. And I mean, I would highly recommend it to anybody. The other thing is something we adopted as part of our honors college curriculum last year, and most people didn't read deeply into it, and it's a book called Empathy Exams. I don't know if anybody's read Empathy Exams, but it really talks, I mean, she does a great job. Like for example, it's essay, so you could read it without having to sit down and deal with it all at one time. But the author goes, talks about in, um, in LA, they have these tours where people go tour gangland, which is bizarre. So white people with money go to LA and pay all this money to go tour this gang territory. And she talks about why that's so problematic and what you're doing with people's uh, identity and culture and this kind of fetish for pain in other communities. It really makes you take a good look at yourself and what's problematic. People that go to Brazil and tour gold mines where people are literally dying around them. Um, it really makes us look at how we're not being fair, how we're not being just. So um, in terms of that, I, mean, I would say this, if I want to recommend something that rock your world by African-American, I would go with K.C. Lehman, who is a professor here at the University of Mississippi. Everything that he writes, I mean, it just makes you look at Mississippi differently. He is very much in love with the state of Mississippi but he's always critiquing the state of Mississippi. And I think until we can really critique our misses in the places where we got it wrong, we'll never stand honestly and get it right. And so he does that. He has a drive and a desire to get it right. So anything by Kiese. His first name is Kiese, K-I-E-S-E. -E. The last name is Layman, L-A-Y-M-O-N. Even read his essays. I mean, he's in New York Times, Washington Post, everything. Just Google, Google and do his articles and I, I promise you, it, it'll blow your mind. Anybody else? Ethel, I'll just ask you one more question. You mentioned Malcolm Gladwell Outliers and he's, he's definitely my favorite writer. Uh, his new, have you read his new book? It's called Talking to Strangers. Yes. I, I, I just finished it this year and I, I loved it. I think it's, you know, he's, I feel like he's always ahead of the time and it, it talks a lot about the unconscious bias. So that was a great book that I thought was so ahead, but um, in some ways just so far behind too. And, and that we're still dealing with that, but it's a really interesting book that he, that he put out too. I think I'm going to teach it in one-on-one -on -one in the fall. Let me tell you all something. I don't know if any of y'all listen to audio books. I just got into listening to some audio books last mm -hmm. year. If you, do or even if you don't if you never listen to another audio book in your life listen to this audio book i've listened to the audio book and read it what was was great about talking to strangers I, and that might be better than outliers um it's built around sandra bland mm -hmm. a black woman who was killed uh in police brutality and in the audio book uh gladwell actually has the sound of the police stop you hear the recording of Sandra Bland when she was stopped by the police. You hear how it was elevated and um, he uses hip hop music and he threads this all throughout the narrative. So there's this song dealing with um, Sandra Bland and it's thread throughout the narrative, whether he's talking about Cuban spies or something else, he always comes back to that moment. It is my, I mean, I, I think I'm gonna use it in one-on-one. -on -one. They might not ask me to teach anymore. They may be like, your 15th year is your last year when I finish, but I, I think I'm going to do it in the fall and, and have people read the audio book. Has anybody listened to that book? Yeah, I listened to it. It's, it's mind blowing, isn't it? I love it. I listen to all his books. I just actually this week finished listening to The Tipping Point because I feel like we're in a tipping point. It, 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 you know, I've re listened to that book so many times, but uh, we actually almost picked that out, Talking to Strangers for the common read. And so I hope we will pick that at some point in the future. I hope so too. Anybody else? And I know I did not talk about race a lot, um, even though my work is centered in race. I just didn't because 
I think so much when we hear social justice, we automatically go there. And I really wanted us to push the bubble and think about it in terms of race and understand why that conversation is important, but also push beyond that to think about how you should think about equity in, in whatever area you're in, um, in this place and once you leave this place also. Just quickly before we sign off, um, actually, I'm actually reading a book right now on, um, it's actually called How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram Kendi. And I don't know if anyone else says, oh, look at Golda, she's, Miss Golda's actually reading. How awesome. I'm actually, so I just started this actually on Monday. It's actually been so good and insightful to like, it brings in like, especially the past few years that we've been going through. And um, it talks about the, you know, how to combat different ways of racism. And when it comes to your way, how do you tackle it pretty much? So definitely if anyone's looking for a book to read, I highly recommend this book right here. And it's getting rave reviews. I thought about that uh, when Golda asked, and I was like, I don't know. I, I, I use, um, I do an honors conversations course, a 391 course. And one year I, I was framing it around that book. So yeah, it's, it's good. Thank you. Anybody what's, what's else? What's the name of the new book that Isabel wrote? Isn't it called Cast? It is. Okay. I haven't read it yet. Have I you read say, it? On a global level, with our work we do, we get a lot of questions not only about the issues in the U.S., but systems outside of the U.S. Mm -hmm. and how do we manage that for employees who live in different countries. And now every time I'm on a, a national call, everybody's talking about, talking about that, but more from an, an understanding so I, I'm going to read it but that might be another one that's great to take a look at. Recommended. I think it's fascinating. It, it it, absolutely fascinating. I have not read it. My it mom asks me every you. week. Have you read it yet? No mom mm -hmm. I haven't. <laughs> it's, uh, Isabel Wilkinson. Did, did somebody write that? Isabel uh, Wilkinson. I can't even talk. Um, so cast it. Thank you so much Mary Sharp. And I see revisionist history. Some people are saying that in the chat box. So I haven't read yeah, that, that. That's Malcolm Gladwell's podcast. Okay. Okay. I can say I haven't read that. So I had to, to do the podcast. I'm slow on the podcast scene. That's good too. I only do um, preaching podcasts. So I'm going to have to get myself caught up. I'm on TD Jakes <laughs> and uh, Stephen Furdy. <laughs> I got to get better. <laughs> Anybody else? Ethel, you are one of the most incredible treasures on our campus. I know a lot of, in your talks, you talk about never envision yourself here. And I, I thank God that you are here and that you're part of our organization. I love the work that you're doing and you're setting an incredible example to these students. And, and I just, you set an example for me. I, I really appreciate not just the academic work and your two classes and go home. I love that you do anything but that, that you work seven days a week in all these different areas. And, you know, you are a role model and we're so thankful that you're that you're here. So thank you very much for all you do. Thank you, Elizabeth. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks everybody for having me.